Okay, section one, the end user portal demo. Um, this is, uh, just, just before I actually show you what I demo, let me show you why I'm going to point out a couple things and really kind of the principles behind this. What you're trying to show these people um, is, is in, really what you're trying to focus on is the simplicity of the tool, the B2C or business to consumer look and feel, um, and sort of the, the antithesis of the, of the legacy notions of um, sort of the old clunky forms, the SharePoint solutions, the Excel spreadsheets that they currently have to fill out today and trying to point out more that there's like an amazon.com dell.com type of, type of experience going on here so you'll see me uh, bring up a lot of little details around that um, i also like to point out very i like to kind of almost poke fun at the fact that there's really not a lot to demo here um, it's like demoing google um, when you, there's nothing to demo on google a google demo takes two minutes um, same thing here is that it's so simple in fact you there's really not a lot to talk about and show it just works exactly like you'd expect it to and then i, I kind of demonstrate the three different pieces. The order in which I go in is I go knowledge first because it's the most simple. Then I go to order things because it's the coolest. It's, it's got kind of the Amazon.com shopping experience. And then I, I, I go over here to get help because that will lend itself um, to the, the incident management piece. We'll actually put in the incident, which is going to transition me um, from my phase one of the demo, which is the end user portal, to phase two um, and three, which is the, the list and form uh, reporting layouts and then ultimately the incident. And so you'll see, kind of see that flow as we go here. Uh, but that's ultimately what we're trying to get at. So generally it goes something like this. I say, um, so the end user portal uh, notion here is 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 a completely different uh, look and feel than what what is the traditional look and feel of the uh, of the application, um, the the more traditional left hand navigation, right hand content type type model that's tr uh, traditional throughout the years in most of the tool sets, um, still very necessary and very useful for technicians. But what we found recently was that the end user um, community is going home and they're using Facebook and they're using Twitter and they're using Google and and Dell.com and Amazon. On. And so what we tried to do is be able to give you the capability to, to front end the tool with a lot more graphical representation of the content that the end users may want to consume. Um, the concept here is that because I'm an end user, there's not a lot I'm going to be able to do with the tool. Um, it'll be very useful for me, but there's really just not a lot I'm going to be doing on a regular basis. And therefore, we can get away with having a lot more graphics and making just look a lot cooler. Um, so there's a lot of different examples of these. This is just one template that we ship. Um, really, this is just nothing more than arbitrary. HTML and CSS, just kind of reorganizing all of the elements in the traditional ServiceNow interface um, to the look and feel that you want. Um, but just to kind of get started, just the three pieces here. Um, one thing I do want to note before I, I, I talk to anything else is um, as I'm clicking through here and showing kind of what the end user could or could not do, note that there's no concept of IT language. And by that I mean you're not going to see the word incident or problem or change or request in here. Those are legacy notions. That was, that was kind of the old tool sets where um, we in IT would kind of require the end users to, to learn our language. We would require them to, to figure out the difference between a request and a change. Um, and that, that was kind of burdensome for the end user community because it required them to either learn it or be trained upon it. No longer. Um, we're, we're trying to do obvious stuff like get help, just basic English language phrases that they can translate. Um, and really, it's, it's not, their, not their problem where it ends up in the back end of the tool. If it's an incident versus a change, they don't care. They just need to get some help in the tool. Um, so very cool there. And we're finding some, some big success um, out in the industry. So quickly, I'll just go through the three modules here. Um, knowledge management, very simplistic concept. If I click on the knowledge in the middle there, um, it works just like Google. So I, I get kind of a um, you know kind of a Yahoo look where it's going to show me some predefined filters of the highest rated articles, the most viewed articles, the current news articles. These are the really important ones about outages and you know employee policies or whatever you dictate. And then if I just do a search on the word email and push enter, what I will get back is a very familiar look and feel that looks exactly like Google. Um, and so you'll get the categorized, refined results on the right hand side but really what I do is I get a little miniature view of every one of the articles that did a text indexed match on the word email so they either had the word email in them they had an attachment with the word email in it or they had a just a piece a keyword um, of email and then it would work just exactly the same way as had they done a search at home they click on the article they read the article and then down near the bottom really the only other thing they have the capability to do is the knowledge centered support type functionality which is more just kind of a blog based um, rating system. 
if you will. It's it's just we took took inspiration from some of the other systems out on the net. Uh, was this helpful? Yes or no? Um, which is just kind of a, a standard yay or nay type answer that'll go back into a reporting engine. Um, the 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 never used rating system, the one star uh, one through five star rating system. Um, traditionally, most of us are pretty polarized, so nobody actually uses that. It's either great or it's not. Uh, but either way, it's there for for your use if if you like it. And then the typical feedback loop where you can extend this and say, you know, this is a great article and whatnot, um, and click submit feedback. All of that, regardless of which th of those three systems um, that you use, is going to feed back to the knowledge team and allow them to focus their attention on the articles that need it. And so that's that's essentially knowledge management um, in a nutshell. Um, knowledge management, just a basic text index search, um, a full HTML and or wiki uh, capability for as far as presentation there, attachments, um, and then the, the scoring algorithm. The second thing I'm going to show is the notion of the, the, the what used to be called kind of the service catalog. Again, to them, they don't see that those ITIL terms on here. It just says order things. And without really talking too much about it, let me just click through here. Um, you'll see the different categorizations. Again, these are completely arbitrary. You will make these up as a business. But the ones we ship are just basic stuff like computers and hardware. And I can go in and do kind of the most basic thing, which is order an iPhone. So if I click on iPhone 4 there, what you'll note right off the bat is that this should look exactly the same as another interface that you're probably using on a, on a, on a weekly basis, which is Amazon. This is the, the sort of the icon um, or little miniature picture um, with the HTML looking description on the right hand side, very nice look and feel. Um, the variable collection at the bottom, sort of the data collection mechanism down here at the bottom, we'll talk about that in just a moment. And then the shopping cart experience in the upper right hand corner. Um, just the, the top two sections of the picture in the, in the description, there's not really a lot to talk about there. Um, they're just they're just cool looking, and they, they look again. They look exactly the same as you'd expect. Um, the the, vi the variables at the bottom here. Now this is another cool thing about the tool. If you've ever gone to Dell.com and ordered a PC, what you would have found is that um, even though the PC has about 150 different types of things you can add on to it, the form is very clean and simplistic. So if I go in and say I want a new laptop, it only asks me four or five questions about it. But based upon the responses to those questions it may actually ask me four or five more. So for instance, one of the four or five initial questions may just be as simple as, do you want to add on a printer? If I say, if I leave it as no, which is the default answer, it just stays there nice and clean and doesn't do anything. But if I answer yes, a lot like in this situation, Dell will prompt me for the five or six printer related questions. And the idea there is that I get presented with a very clean, very concise, very non-intrusive form. Um, but as I begin to fill it out, it will sort of contextually grow and it's kind of surgically ask me for the information as it needs it. Um, it helps with end user experience, and it's also very, very critical just to make sure that you, you drive the process of data collection in the appropriate manner. So in this particular example, is, there, is this a replacement? No is the default, so you don't need any information. If it is a replacement, yes, I need the, the phone number originally. And then basic things like string fields and whatnot. And then when I go up and actually click order now, what I'll get is again a, a very familiar notion. This is the checkout screen. Um, all of this is completely optional, of course, the, the notion of the pricing um, the, the checkout card and all of that, but this is kind of the default model here. I can request it for myself, which is the default. You'll note it automatically filled that up for me because I am logged in as Joe employee here. And then it automatically input my address from my user profile. Um, and then when I click Submit Order down here in the lower right hand corner, you'll note a couple things that I get. I get kind of a status screen that lets me know an estimated delivery date based upon a workflow. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the demo. And then the stage widget here, which simply gives me the four kind of high level stages. Th these are the things that need to happen in order for this particular service or item, in this case the iPhone, uh, to be delivered. And so four things. And then I can click that plus button and get kind of a little description of each one of those. And then the green uh, checkbox just indicates where we currently sit. And those will colorize themselves as you move through the process of the workflow there. So very obvious, very simplistic. Um, going back, let me go back to order things. I'm going to do the exact same thing. Only I'm, in this case, I'm going to choose development laptop. And the only reason I come into here is to show you a couple different uh, types of variables. Um, rather than having a sort of strings that we're filling out, I can give you know arbitrary choice lists. And then, of course, the pricing notions on top of that. Um, the pricing where I'm, I'm adding things, I'm removing things, and it's updating the, the price in the cart in the upper right-hand corner. I don't know if you can see that. 
Now, if you're an organization that does chargeback or billback, that becomes critical. You've got to be able to charge people for the stuff that they're ordering, um, not just physical items either, you know, even services, email services, accounts, that sort of thing. You may want to charge them for that. Um, which, what we're also finding, however, is um, some people are using prices that don't even have any concept of, of chargeback. So we have businesses out there now that are putting things like um, an, an additional $110 for a 100 gig hard drive to simply drive behavior. And so even though that $110 may not mean anything to the business, from an end user psychologically, I'm less apt to go for the for the higher priced options. And so you can you can start to utilize the service catalog here to drive some of the behavior to, to do a little bit more standardization within IT. So let me go back. A couple other things you can do here. So let me go to order things. So really just ordering thing onesie, twosie, that's all good and well. But what if you want to go the other way? Um, what if I want to do something like onboarding a new employee? So clicking on services, I can go into my new employee hire. Um, you'll note this is a little bit different. Same look and feel, but it's a completely different notion. It's kind of the reverse. And let me just fill it out so I can show you um, what it does. If I hire Jared Bennett to be the CTO, and then I, I put in the IT department here and say that he needs an iPhone and a telephone extension. Rather than Jared Bennett going in and actually ordering things onesie twosie in the system and being able to select what he or she wants, we go the other way here. We present a form that collects a bunch of data from you based upon whatever the need is, in this case a new employee hire, and then based upon the responses, we as the IT department, the tool will prescribe a litany of hardware based upon kind of a matrix that you define in the background that says if they have this title and they're in this department and they and they make this amount of money and they're you know whatever variables you want and their their name starts with J then they get an executive desktop um, so in this case obviously the CTO um, uh, gets an executive desktop if I were to go back a screen and change that to a uh, sales executive in the sales department You'll note if I click Choose Options, it should completely switch that and prescribe me something different, in this case, the IBM ThinkPad sales laptop. And then at the top here, I get my other two tabs for the other two devices. This is the exact same item we looked at a moment ago, and then a telephone extension, all three of which have their own variable sets, their own questions that it's going to ask me, um, and then but all three of them are essentially bundled together and prescribed to me based upon my answers. So whether you want to go specific item ordering or whether you want to go sort of the prescriptive type model, um, we do a accommodate either one. And then after you're done, um, like always, you go down to checkout. You get your checkout screen. In this case, I have three items instead of just the one. I submit the order, and the same thing applies. I get the the, uh, the same screen here that shows me the delivery dates. One thing to note, the iPhone and the phone are all going to be delivered on 925. That's in about three days' time. I need another three days in order to deliver that ThinkPad. Why? Well, it runs a completely separate workflow. You'll see there's actually four or five more steps um, to deliver the, the uh, IBM ThinkPad than there is for an iPhone which would make sense. The only thing I'm trying to indicate there is the fact that every one of these items has the potential to have its own, its, com its completely unique workflow. Um, one item may get six approvals and two tasks and then take you know six weeks to deliver. Another item may just be a pencil sharpener, and so it doesn't even need an approval. It's just a task for a procurement guy to go out and deliver that to your desk, um, and that may take six hours. Um, but you, you'll have the, the flexibility in the tool to be able to define that in any layer you want. All right, and then really the last section here, um, I've done knowledge, I've done sort of the order things notion, is the get help section. This is what used to be named incident management and still is in the back end of the tool um, as far as the Beth Anglin technician user is concerned. But again, to the end user, if I click on get help, basic things like is something broken? Do you have a question? Do you want to report an outage? Basic things like that. Do you want to check the status of your, of your pre-existing tickets? I can go in and click on the status. Every open ticket that I currently have, every open incident, every open change request that I've put in, I can go into here, click on them, and get a little miniature version of the, of the status. Or I can generate something new. So I can go to Get Help and say something's broken. And one thing I want you to note right off the bat here is that even though this will ultimately end up being an incident in the background, we did not force the end user to fill out one giant clunky incident management form. What they get instead is, is just like they were the, uh, the service catalog side of this, they get just a surgical list of questions, really collect the minimal amount, amount of information we need and nothing additional. So you'll be able to tell me who's it, who it's for, what the impact happens to be. You can say SAP Financials is down um, on floor four. 
put in a basic description and then click submit into the tool and then it will present me back a nice looking business message that says thank you very much for submitting uh, we'll kind of get back to you and then of course in the background that's going to generate an incident that we're actually as part of the demo going to work in just a moment we're going to treat that as a as an outage and actually work that SAP financials problem but for now the end user through the experience has been able to onboard a new employee order a bunch of hardware um, check the knowledge base for certain things and report an, uh, an issue all in one interface all very consistently and all all without having to be trained um, on anything. Last thing I want to show um, before I transition over to the other side is the notion of chat. And this is kind of a newer notion to us. Um, this is about a year and a half old. Um, in the tool now. And what this is is the capability to to facilitate a little bit more efficient way to get your service desk to help people. So if you want to initiate this into the business, whether your culture can tolerate it or not, you can go in and, and give them that button that says help desk chat. And Joe gets a very obvious interface that says help, you know, uh, people soft, not working again. And you'll note what happened is he gets kind of a canned message that says, thank you very much. Um, the, you're number one in the queue, and we, out, we estimate it's going to take about 17 seconds to answer that. Now, on the other side of the equation, what I want to do is let me flip over to the Beth interface here. Because um, I want to show you that, um, oh, look at that, it didn't show up. Ah, uh, bummer. It's supposed to show up there. I'll have to figure out why that happened. But anyway, he gets the full the full chat capability. He gets to be able to chat with Beth. Anyone in the service desk group and anyone who has the capability to answer those chats can chat back and forth with him. They'll have a full conversation, and then eventually one of the two of them will click on this little cog and say, you know what, this is important enough. I want to create an incident from this chat. And that will generate an incident automatically in the background, and it'll also capture that entire conversation and paste it into there as well for you. So you don't have to go hunting around later to try to figure out what the source of this was, the whole conversation will be sitting there in the history uh, ready to go. So that's the end user portal um, it, it kind of in a nutshell.